our next speaker, who is Chetan Kutur, Chetan Kutur, who is Lang O'Rourke's Head of Tech and Innovation for Europe. Chetan joined Lang O'Rourke last autumn from the Volvo-owned EV brand Polestar, and he's going to talk about technologies and innovations in other sectors that he believes have the potential to bring about permanent change across the construction sector. Please welcome Chetan Kutur. Hi, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm Chetan Kutur, uh, the head of technology and innovation at Lang O'Rourke. Uh, today, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my story, my journey to here today to be with you, uh, what I've been getting up to in the last few years, what my team is working on at the moment, and what we look to towards for the future. Now, I actually don't come from the construction industry, as was just mentioned. I've spent the last 10 years designing cars. Um, I had a childhood dream, and that was to uh, design cars. And I got to live that dream uh, in Sweden, in Gothenburg, working first for Volvo, uh, being part of the whole brand redesign and the renewal of the whole product portfolio at Volvo, um, living my dream as a <laughs> like a child in a sweet shop. Um, and during that process, we got to a point where we were started innovating beyond what we imagined, and we started creating things which we hadn't actually considered within the Volvo family. They were beyond the realms of Volvo. And from designing cars, we actually then got ourselves to a position where we had designed products and opportunities which could be looked at very differently, challenging the status quo. And that's actually where we got the opportunity to launch a brand new electric performance car brand, Polestar. Now, I went from living my dream designing cars to then getting the opportunity with a phenomenal team to design and build an electric car company from a clean sheet of paper. It was really, really special. This is a picture. I've got some personal pictures here to share with you. This is a picture from um, our factory for Polestar 1, our first product, uh, uh, driving one of the first cars off the line. And why Polestar? What was the purpose? Polestar was set up really to accelerate the shift to sustainable mobility. Polestar 1 is a beautiful GT sports car, really at the time was pushing the boundaries of electrification, integrating a high degree of electrification into a car that was beautiful, premium, and high-end, something that hadn't really been cracked in the car industry at that point. So from there, we then realized as a brand, we've got an opportunity to really make a mark on many different areas of the industry. Now, there was many things in the car industry which we were really frustrated with at Polestar. Um, and the group of us there were really thinking, how can we go about bringing about sustainable and real change? So with Polestar 2, which was our first fully electric car, we addressed many things. Apart from really shifting the electrification journey forwards, we also wanted to address transparency. Transparency is something that has been a very difficult topic in the car industry, and over many years, I'm sure you've been reading many headlines that trust in car OEMs has dropped over, over time because of various things. So for us, we actually took this opportunity with Polestar 2 to, um, to, do, to use technology for the first time in different ways. So Polestar 2 was the first car in the world to use blockchain technology in the supply chain process of cobalt which is a critical element in the manufacture of lithium-ion batteries. Now, what that did was basically meaning that from the mine to the factory floor, we could track every single gram of cobalt. It was all publicly, the ledgers were all publicly released, and it also was a call to action to the rest of the industry. We were then able to spread that to different materials and actually look at what was possible in different, um, different parts of the car. Pulsar 2 was also the first car in the world where we actually did a life cycle assessment. So here we were, launching a brand new pure electric car and telling the world it wasn't clean. Every Pulsar 2 had a carbon footprint of about 25 tons of carbon dioxide per car before it even reached the customer. And that was an actual provocative step to go out and basically say to the industry, this is where we're at. And Pulsar 2 is probably one of the most ethically produced cars up to date but we wanted to make sure that we're provocative in the way that we're being honest and transparent because at the end of the day, the only way you can bring about disruptive change is if you're honest about what the situation is today. Very often we kind of hide and kind of think, oh, we shouldn't really be talking about it. We should absolutely be transparent and only when you know what the situation is today can you actually go about changing and addressing it for tomorrow. 
Pulsar 2 was also an opportunity for us to demonstrate effective open innovation. So how many of you have had cars where you've been very frustrated with the voice recognition software? You want to call your wife on the way home, but it ends up calling your boss. Absolute disaster. We realized that actually car companies weren't very good at developing infotainment systems. So what did we do? We went to the best. We went to Google. We actually went to Google for the first time and said, would you be interested in developing the, an Android operating system for the car? So that's exactly what we did. We got Google Maps embedded in the car, and we had Google voice recognition and a speech assistant basically to help basically solve a massive problem. Again, taking a huge shift. And it's that mindset of looking to do things in a fresher way, looking at first principles rather than just doing iterative design that brings about change. Now this car, the Polestar Precept, was a car that we released, which I'm very proud of. And this baby really pushed the boundaries of sustainability. Because there was a lot of talk about sustainability, but not as much tangible action. So in this car, we actually looked about how do we go to a minute detail and a granular detail on material technology and see how can we innovate to push sustainability forward in the industry. And one of the things we did, um, an example, is we realized when we did a study that most plastics in an interior of a car are virgin plastics, terrible carbon footprint. So we identified that 85% of those interior plastics could actually be replaced with a natural composite called flax fiber. And so what we did is we worked with a tier two supplier, actually, which was not common at that point, and developed with them this amazing new innovation to bring about a whole new step change in how to actually develop car interiors, which, we're now, which now the company is rolling out over several years in various different products. Why were car interiors and why have they all just been virgin plastics? Because iterative design. We just keep doing things again and again and again the same way we've always done it. What we did is we took a step back, looked at it from first principles, and thought, how can we actually do this in a fresh, new way and change the boundaries? And having that mindset and that headspace to do that is really what is important to make considerable change. So Polestar's mission was really to be the guiding star for the car industry, challenge the status quo, and accelerate the shift to sustainable mobility. So why am I now in the construction industry? I was actually really inspired as an engineer um, and really intrigued by some of the biggest challenges facing construction. To name but just a few, the skill shortage was something which I was really perplexed by, thinking we've got so much to be developed over the next few years in the future, but we simply don't have the labor force to be able to deliver it. There is a massive shortage in skills, and there's an aging workforce. Health and safety issues have plagued the industry all over for many, many years, and has created a stigma attached to construction, actually, when you look from different industries. And I was really interested in why haven't we really accelerated to des design out those risks? To combine with that, inclusion and well-being. I mean, if you go to a construction site today, there is a general demographic that you see commonplace across the world. Why is that? And also long working hours. I mean, that's something that's <laughs> not a great thing in the construction industry. Is there a way that we can tackle that with innovation? Productivity and program pressures as well. Delays are something which we've commonly plagued with and, al and always uh, challenged with. Is there a way to really change that productivity in a step change way? And of course, quality issues. There's so many quality issues that many construction companies face on a, on a daily basis. But also, the slow adoption of emerging technology. And that's been explained to me that, oh, you know, but that's because every project is bespoke. We have to do every single project unique and different. Is that true? And of course, sustainability. The sector contributes to 39% of global emissions. There's a huge challenge to go there. So for me, I was really inspired at the opportunity and realized that as an engineer and as engineers, we have a duty and a responsibility to take on those challenges and solve some of the biggest problems affecting society today. So why Langer Rook? Now, Langer Rook, um, really excited me because they've got an amazing progressive mindset. It's already to date, 200 million pounds has been invested in off-site modular design for manufacturing assembly. That's off-site modular construction at a state-of-the-art facility, which we call the Center of Excellence for Modern Construction in Worksop. Now, this facility actually is really pushing the boundaries and has been for many years. 
8,000 people are directly employed through an integrated supply chain, which again is a very interesting model in construction. So we have real good control. We can control those quality issues. We can have an end-to-end -end delivery. So when a client comes to us, we package it together and we can deliver a program from start to finish. And also something that Langer Work is working towards, which I'm really proud of and very excited about, was by 2033, Langer Work has announced that there will be a 50-50 gender balance. 2033 in a construction company gender balance. Really excited about that. And 100 million pounds has already to date been invested in research and development. That really shows a progressive forward thinking mindset of really pushing the boundaries of innovation and seeing what could be achieved next. Now for me, coming from the car industry, apart from the mindset and some of the challenges that I talked to you about before, about looking at things from a fresh perspective, there are other things which really, I think, there are massive opportunities to, to, to play with. And that is really balancing customization with standardization. The car industry for many decades has been really embracing platform engineering and advanced manufacturing with a high digital maturity. There is so much potential in space in the construction industry to go there. And what we're talking about here is customizing the visible, standardizing the invisible. So what are we trying to do at Langer Work? We're trying to accelerate the shift to sustainable construction, pushing the boundaries of what's possible in service of humanity. So to give you a little bit of an insight into what my team is doing, we are pushing the boundaries of what's possible through what I like to call the four Ms. That is modules, machines, materials, and methods. Modules is taking the intrinsic philosophy of Langer Work and finding new ways to really push the boundaries of how we create modular construction across the sectors. Machines is really talking about how do we find innovative auto automated ways to bring about massive well-being and productivity step changes. Materials looking at how do we design and find new opportunities to push the boundaries of sustainability in our industry. And methods is everything we do. That is really the kryptonite at Langer Work. How do we constantly challenge ourselves with the lessons learned we have from every project to find new, smarter, and quicker ways to get the fantastic results that we aim for? So to give you a little bit of an insight into what my team have been working on in the last few weeks and months, I have some examples to share with you of some of the great innovations we've been coming up with. The first one is modular lifts. So we've actually very recently uh, delivered these, uh, this product um, in buildings in near King's Cross in London. And my colleague Sam will actually uh, now explain a little bit about how we've gone about tackling that problem. This is joint collaboration between ourselves and Connie embarked on the challenge to solve the modular lift problem. One of the major benefits of the modular lift system is that it encourages a safer working environment the Langer Walk approach to safety is really second to none. We're building these modules off site, reducing the risk. It's done in a controlled environment. Once the module arrives at the site, we simply lift it from the back of the wagon onto the floor, right to the module. It's lifted up into position and installed into the shaft. Now, this happens in about 90 minutes. And when you consider a traditional lift install taking approximately one week per floor as a general rule of thumb, the ability to get an entire three-story module in 90 minutes is transformative. An additional benefit is the occupational health benefits. Controlling dust inside a lift shaft can be pretty hazardous, and noise as well, because it's an enclosed space. Obviously, with this module being built off-site and manufactured off-site and then being dropped in, it again reduces those occupational health risks that we have to manage on a daily basis with the construction. Really exciting. We now have um, an opportunity up ahead, a pipeline to really start looking at how can we roll this technology out and actually innovate on top of this, finding smarter ways, improving working conditions, and actually improving the productivity. The second example I wanted to um, bring up, actually, is our digital modular bridges. Now, this is very, very exciting. Tomorrow, my colleague Phil Robinson, who works on my team, will actually be presenting here at the conference uh, to go in a bit more detail. But here, we are really looking at creating a digital toolkit with a modular kit of parts to transform the way that we build and design bridges. 
And to put into context the productivity potential here, we have got now to a stage where a single span concrete bridge, which would take maybe three months at least to get to a concept level, we can actually do in three hours. It is a huge shift in the way that we design. It's a, coming back to that standardization question. And also, it is really taking care of massive program gains with huge productivity improvements. That's a fantastic piece of work that's been done with my team and together with WSP and Ramble. Um, really, again, that collaborative and innovative mindset taking a different approach to how you do things. The last and the third, well, the third example I wanted to talk to you about today was um, an, an announcement we made very recently um, and made public that from now onwards, Lang Rourke will only use low carbon concrete in all of our projects that we deliver. That's, an, uh, that's a sector first, actually, and that's, again, that challenge we're setting to ourselves and also provoking to the industry to say, call to action. If we want to talk about change, we need to start acting there and doing it. So low carbon concrete will be um, used on all of our projects moving forward um, as a minimum requirement. So I've told you a little bit about the kind of projects we're working on at the moment, bringing about rather transformative change in their respective areas. But what will be different in the future? What are we aiming towards? What's the goals? What is the art of the possible? And here we have a few things that we're aiming towards to try and tackle. Not operational, operational net zero carbon, scope one and two, is absolutely what we're going for in a very, very short space of time. This is a commitment across the whole of Lang Rook where we're really, really driving for that accelerated change. An intelligent 35 hour week. This is where we have an amazing agenda called trades to technicians. We're finding opportunities to, to create multi-skill technicians for the future and actually find an, a very smart way to have 24 seven machines working and technicians supporting that for all of the builds that we do. Advanced manufacturing. This is really where we're learning from other industries such as the car industry, aerospace industry, and maximizing the opportunity for huge productivity gains using automation, augmentation, to really drive massive progress, helping well-being, helping program, helping certainty. And there we go. Driving predictability of financial performance is what happens when you have that full control. You understand quality, you understand precision, and you understand the process end to end. And of course, to wrap it together, data. Being a data-driven company is absolutely paramount. We are really pulling together all of our data streams to have intelligence and built solutions. And by that, harnessing artificial intelligence and predictive analytics to help optimize and drive efficiency throughout absolutely everything we do. So, I am very humbled to be here now, having come from the car industry to come and work in this amazing industry in construction. Lang Rook, I really believe, has a phenomenal potential with the amazing to date progress that has been made to now come about and help accelerate the change and push the boundaries of how we innovate for tomorrow. Thank you very much for listening. So I have a couple of questions and don't forget, of course, um, hashtag interchange is the way you can put your questions to Chetan as well. Um, in fact, should we start off? Where do you see technology playing a role in reaching your sustainability goals? Well, with some of the examples that I talked about there, I mean, you know, low carbon zero is uh, low um, carbon concrete is one example of 
a step on the journey. But actually what we're doing there is um, finding at every kind of uh, step in the process from an end-to-end -end perspective, looking at the whole supply chain, looking at procurement, looking at all channels in the company uh, for opportunities to really drive out. And you have to take that uh, really micro-level detailed approach um, to, go, uh, to go about getting to, um, to the sustainability goals. Um, but I think it's about collaboration across the whole company, um, all departments and all units to basically draw march together towards the, um, the goal that we've set. Speaking about goals, you, um, how are you planning on achieving, asks uh, somebody in the audience, a 50-50 gender workforce? And that comes down to innovation as well. I mean, some of the techniques and methodologies that are being used in, constru in construction, for me being a new player here, have been rather shocking. I mean, the, the methods and techniques that have been used for thousands of years and have a certain demographic of how you can actually lift heavy parts of reinforcement. If you use smart technology to be able to uh, take care of a lot of the things that have been predisposed to certain demographics, um, then like what I talked about, our trades to technician agenda is exactly that. You can have a, a gender um, diverse workforce um, in our offices, um, we are already seeing a really good gender, uh, gender balance. Um, and on site, this is now the target which we're looking at. But again, Langer Work also specializes in off-site manufacturing. And when you take things into an off-site environment where you can really harness advanced manufacturing, the opportunities are endless. But yeah, I mean, 2033 is not a long way away. Mm -hmm. And we are running extremely fast to make sure we deliver that. You've talked a lot about technology. Where do you see technology, ask somebody in the audience, playing a role in reaching your sustainability goals? So technology with sustainability, I mean, it's, it's intrinsic. We need, to, like I said, we are we're really looking at all kinds of technologies when it comes to material science. We're looking at technologies in terms of um, how you automate to bring about much better sustainability. Um, for example, the, the modular bridges that I showed, the digital modular bridges, We've now got to a stage where we've rapidly uh, shortened program times and, got, and really shortened prelims. Um, now we're looking at how do we scope out the material changes and also um, working processes and methods to really get to the sustainability goals for those programs. The so technology is intrinsic to it all. Absolutely. I want to get through as many of these questions as possible. What is the biggest challenge, asked somebody else, facing adoption of your modular solutions? There are, there are lots of challenges. Um, the biggest challenge is really is um, getting uh, a really smart mindset and a collaborative effort from the start. Uh, when, you, when you have a modular mindset, like in aerospace or automotive, you have to really start designing early. You have to get really early in the process to make sure that you can, you can influence that change and actually bring about a much smarter, better way of doing it. Um, so I think the biggest challenge really is collaboration across the industry. Um, but you know we've got a real life examples of showing that it can be done uh, and it can bring about massive improvements to the way of working. I think it's a final one because we've answered all those questions there. Um, what does the construction se sector do well? You've got the benefit of coming from the car industry. What's construction doing well in your opinion? I mean, I'm every day inspired by being in the construction industry. I think the, the mindset, the can-do attitude, the kind of drive and ambition um, to, to, to deliver uh, you know, clients' expectations and to deliver with, um, with better methods, um, I think is, is really exciting. Um, I think the construction industry really does what it does best. I mean, like I said, these methods have been going on for thousands of years. It's way, this industry predates the car industry quite a bit. <laughs> um, so I think the, the, the methods of how things have been done so far are remarkable. Um, there's so much more to do, so much room to grow, uh, and I think we've got amazing people um, to be able to take us on that journey to create a much brighter future for tomorrow. So you definitely feel that you've come into the right industry because you were showing us some pretty sexy car <laughs> pictures, you know, at the top there. Am yeah, I right? Yeah, no, I mean, you know, uh, I live my dream. You know, I, I designed cars, I launched an electric car company that's global. Um, and it, that will always be in my heart. Um, but you know, now having seen what's possible in the car industry and creating disruptive change, looking at the construction industry and seeing the opportunity to make a huge impact on society and really transform things for a much brighter t tomorrow, um, that's what makes me get up in the morning. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I've got a fire in my belly and I'm uh, very excited to be here 
um, to help um, to help uh, work in the construction industry. Amazing, thank you. And we, we really felt that passion. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs>